Hey, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on the location from where you are joining. My name is Amit Chandak, and I'm a data platform MVP and a Microsoft Power BI Community Super User. I warmly welcome all of you to another session of Microsoft Learn. And today we are going to learn about ingest data with Spark and Microsoft Fabric Notebooks. And joining me is fellow MVP Chris. I welcome you, Chris. Tell more about you. Hi, good morning, Amit. Uh, so I'm Chris Hyde. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, it's evening here in Texas, so I'm still a day behind uh, all of you. Uh, but also, it's not just the two of us on the call this evening. Uh, we also have a wonderful uh, moderator, Martin Catherall. He's going to be monitoring the YouTube chat, so keep him busy. Uh, yeah, send him as many questions as possible. Keep him on his toes. Uh, we're also joined by our excellent moderator, Matt, and Matt will post any helpful links in the chat, like this one, for example, a link to uh, the Learn Live module that we're going to be going over today. And so speaking of the chat, we'd love to have all of you involved this morning, whether it's just to ask a question about the material we're covering, something else related to data ingestion with Spark, or even just to say hi. Yeah, let's make this uh, as interactive as possible. So there is a live and interactive chat which is on and you can type your messages by saying hi and continue to chat with us. And also take the full advantage of the cloud skill challenge for to become the fabric analytics engineer, a certified fabric analytics engineer. Once you complete this challenge, you will get a 50% discount coupon, which you can utilize to take this exam. So it's a wonderful opportunity. So why don't you go ahead and take this exam after you complete all these sessions with us? So Chris will let you know more about exam cram. Yeah, so if you're thinking of taking the DP600 exam, you'll definitely want to register for this session. And it's next Thursday morning. We've got several experts on tap. They're going to cover the materials that are going to be in the exam. You know, at a high level, they won't dive into everything, but just to you know, cover all the skills that will be measured. They'll go through some tips in taking the exam, so you're definitely going to want to check this out if taking this exam is on your radar. And then after the exam cram, you'll also want to head over to the Fabric Career Hub. Uh, this is a great place to, there's some experts who will talk, they'll give some interviews about how kind of Fabric can advance your career. And there's this wonderful little flow chart here that sort of tells you all the different components of fabric, like which job roles will you be doing, which fabric roles in. You know, for example, you can see right here, we're gonna talk about ingestion today. And that's great if you want to be an analytics engineer. It's also something that if we were to tab over to data engineer, you see ingestion is very important in that role as well. So this helps you get a good grip on to be areas that, you know, if you want to be a data analyst, for example, which of the uh, sessions in our series will you want to pay the most attention to? So, so more exciting news for all of you, the first ever Microsoft Fabric Conference that would be held from 26th March to 28th March on La in Las Vegas and join the Microsoft team for 100 plus sessions uh, which are going to happen in this particular conference. Uh, and so we are sharing a code for you which you can utilize MSCUST to get a $100 discount if you register using this code. So take the full advantage of this code. Now, we are doing this learn session for a couple of weeks now. This is the first wave's last uh, 
second last session we have today and in this session we are covering ingest data with spark and microsoft fabric notebooks we will have a repeat session in the evening at us time and then tomorrow we will be covering administered microsoft fabric which is going to be another session on this series so take full advantage of that So what we are going to cover today. So the learning objective for today is ingesting the external data to Microsoft Fabric Lake Houses using Spark. So we are going to use Spark notebooks today and going to ingest the external data. Then we will configure the external sources, authentication and optimization that it will also take you through. Then the last one is load data into the lake house as files or delta tables. So what kind of formats are supported and how we are going to store in those particular format that will also will take you through. So now Chris will take you through the real action on the Microsoft Fabric notebook. All right, thanks Amit. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it. Uh, so we've decided that we're going to go with a new lake house in our fabric tenant. So the first thing we need to do is get some data into it. So also known as ingestion. Uh, so we're going to use some Spark notebooks to do this. So they're great at handling large data sets uh, very efficiently. And also a perfect way to get data into the bronze layer. That's kind of the staging layer of our lake house. And then we can use some of the powerful transformation features uh, available to prepare our data to move further on into the silver layer and later the gold layer. So let's show uh, pulling data into Fabric with our uh, Spark notebooks. Uh, so we'll see a picture here of creating a new notebook in several areas of our Fabric service. I'm right, going if you could skip ahead one slide, please. All right. So here's uh, creating the notebooks. And then let's see the next example of our PySpark code that we're using uh, to connect to an external data source. All right, but it's not great to just see it on the slide, right? Let's switch over to Fabric itself and we'll show you a demo of how this works right off the bat. All right. So I'm in my uh, fabric trial here, and I'm in my work, here's a workspace I've set up. I'm using the trial, I've got 32 days left, we see up here. And I'm going to go over to my lake house. We've got a completely empty lake house, no tables, no files. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a notebook. So we've got a couple of ways to do this. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, go from here. We're going to open the notebook, and I'm going to just start with a brand new notebook here. Gives a second for it to create. And here's our notebook. We're going to have a series of cells. We can see here uh, that this is a PySpark cell, so it's our Python code uh, with all the Spark stuff wrapped into it. But we can add additional cells down here. And these cells can be either code cells or markdown, uh, which is similar to an, an easy version of HTML. Right? Uh, we can do some things up here. So just everything in Fabric, right? There's multiple ways to do things. So just because I may be showing clicking here to create a new cell, you know, there may be something else up in the window here. We can do exactly the same thing to create code on markdown cells. And I'm going crazy here with some of these new cells. So let's delete a few. And let's go ahead and take that code. Uh, and I've got it copied over here. So here is the code that we're showing. Let's go ahead and paste that into our notebook. And you'll find actually that if you're running this piece right off the slide, we don't actually need this uh, SAS token here. So let's take that out. 
Let's go ahead and take this piece out as we won't need to refer to it. And we'll see that we've got some variables here to set up uh, our name, the name of our blob account, the name of our container, and then a relative path within it. We're going to go ahead and uh, set up a connection. We're going to read some data, which we already know it's in Parquet format from that connection. And then we will show the data frame. So let's go ahead and run everything here. Now, the first time you run this, this is going to take a few seconds, maybe four or five, just to create your first Spark session. And we should see, here we go, the little pop-up here, session started in five seconds. And so this, okay, we've got an error. Of course, this didn't happen uh, while I was doing any of the practicing. Uh, so let's try one more place. Okay, let's see if this one works a little bit better. There we go. That should be much better. All right, it's going to pull in uh, our job. It's going to read everything into a data frame, and we'd be able, you know, 12 seconds, everything has been pulled in. But this isn't a great way to look at it. I'm going to show instead. Let's go back out to our workspace. I'm going to open a notebook that I'd already started creating earlier. All right, so we can see right away, and if I click on one of these cells, we can see this is what Markdown looks like. So a big header is a single uh, number sign. The smaller header here is three, and those will scale up. Uh, so it's good to have sort of some markdown and even some comments in code. We see this later. I like to sort of use the markdown to say, here's what I'm doing. And then any comments are, well, this is why I'm doing it, or this is why so if I chose, in this case, to use a display instead of the dot show method uh, for clean the look. So that's that's how I'll divide things up between both. And we've got this kind of broken down into an easier to read piece. So again, we're going to read our data from our blob storage, construct the path for a connection. Now let's just run through a cell at a time. So let's go ahead and create our variables. All right. So it took you know, most of that time was just starting up our Spark session for this notebook. Now we're going to construct the path for the connection. Let's read in the data from Azure Blob Storage. And this will probably see between 12 and 20 seconds most of the time. Uh, let's keep our fingers crossed here. 12 seconds on the dot. And then let's display this in a data frame. So we, when we say a data frame, this is just a tabular object, so rows and columns of data in memory. And we see, yeah, we've got a bunch of data just in a nice, neat tabular format. So that's you know, pulling our data in from an external source. Now, we can also read the data in from an Azure SQL database, for example. Uh, now, I've just got an example here. I'm not really going to give you my Azure SQL database info, but it works you know, very similar. We're going to have variables containing the info that we need to make the connection. Now, in this case, we will also need variables to contain our authentication uh, information. We're going to build a URL. We're going to use JDBC uh, and uh, integrate it into Active Directory. We've defined the properties, then we read in the data frame, and then we display the data frame, same as before. 
All right, so let's jump back to the slides. All right, I think we've got some inception going on here. Uh, let's go back to the sites and there we are. And so that's what the code looks like for uh, the example for connecting to the Azure SQL database. All right, uh, let's switch over to Ahmed for the next part of the session, please. Okay, so now we will have a look how to write the data into the data lake. So, so as you are now connected to the data, we need to save the data into the lake house. So what happens, you connect to the data and you loaded it into the data frame and now you wanted to save it. So what are the options we have? So the options that we have with us here is basically, we can save it in multiple formats. So this is the way you read the, uh, this is uh, my variable where I'm having a file name, which I'm planning to read. And then I want to write it. So df dot write mode. So I am writing a data frame and the mode is overwrite means I'm going to overwrite what is already written dot parquet, the pa format is the parquet and the parquet output path. This is the path on which I'm going to write it down. So basically this is the full path where I'm going to write it down by file. And then after that, the print statement in Python prints the statement. And if you want to print a statement within the double quotes, you give the variable name in the angular brackets. So data frame has been written to parquet file and we are giving the path inside the double quotes. It means we are going to print the variable parquet output path. Then write data frame to delta table. Now, previously we have written into parquet format. Now, parquet format is the column of storage format which we use, but delta parquet is the format which we are using in Fabric. Microsoft Fabric consider delta parquet format files as the tables. And this is the format which support the asset transactions because of which you are able to do treat it like as a database tables. Now, how do we write down to a delta parquet format? For that, I'm giving a delta table name and then I'm using df.write format delta mode again, overwrite, save as table. Save as the table is what is going to save it as a table into the delta parquet format. And then again, we are printing the statement that will show us that the data frame has been written. I will show that in action in a moment, but let's move to the next slide first. So if you want to know more about the file formats and the concepts behind it, you can scan this particular link and utilize the information provided in this particular blog. So just scan the code and get more information about that. Then once you write to the delta format, you have another option to write it. So let's say I've given a table name, then I can say my filter DF, it means I have already done some data transformation and I want to filter the data. And after that, again, I want to write. So write dot mode is overwrite, format is delta. So when we specify format, we have to specify it's a delta format. So delta parquet, the format is delta. And then we simply say save and the path. This is the path which we are going to get from the lake house. And this is relative path this in, we have used at this moment. It means we are connected to the lake house and we are using the relative path. It is not the full path we have used in this command. And then next we are printing it. Fabric notebooks can easily scale to the large data. Therefore the right optimization is the key. So considering the optimization function, even more performant data ingestion. And for that, we have two functions, which we are going to cover during the exercise, but I'll show you on the notebook just after this slide. And those two functions are spark.config.set. And using that, we are going to set the spark.sql.pocket.vorder.enable true. And second thing which we are going to enable, which is enable automatic delta optimization, right? Is spark.microsoft.delta optimize write enable true. 
So now let me do one thing. Let me quickly show you some of these things in action. So what I have done here is basically I have an external file which I wanted to bring in and let me run this command as Chris has already explained to you about uh, the spark and how does it start. So it should quickly start within four to five seconds. And because I'm using the Delta's external file, the Spark data frame was not directly reading it. So I have used a Pandas data frame to read it. And because I've used a Pandas data frame and I want to write back to the Delta file where which is easier to be written using the Spark data frame, I'm doing a conversion here. So Spark.create data frame, this is Pandas data frame. And then once it is converted, I'm just trying to print the schema here. So let's look at the Spark data frame. This is what has been loaded to my Spark data frame. So this is the data which I have. This is the common sales data, which I have also shared over GitHub. Now comes the real uh, action. Now I'm using a file path if you, here. If you notice, this is the parquet output path, which I'm using here from where I'm getting it. So if you want to get this path, so what you can do is you can go to the files and you can use copy absolute path. So once you copy the absolute path, you will get this complete path, ABFS and the ID, everything. And what you need to do at the end, you need to decide where you are going to save either to the tables or to the files. You might get a, a path where there is slash files at the end. You can replace it with slash tables. So slash files and slash tables, these are treated as two folders. So in the lake house, when you go to the lake house explorer, we divide the data into two parts, files and the tables. Anything which is in the Delta Parquet format would be treated as table. And that's where we are using this slash tables path to whenever we are planning to save the data. Now, because I'm going to plan to save to Parquet file, I should be preferring the mode data to be written into files folder, not to the table folder. But in both the cases, what I've done here is I'm saving it to the table folder. So let me execute this code, which we have already seen. So it's going to save the file, first of all, into the parquet format, into the tables folder. And you will see there will be some addition on this undefined because of that. Then I'm going to save the file into the table format, which is the Delta parquet format. So this code is running right now. And while it is running, it, it completes certain jobs. So all the information of those jobs would be here. So eight jobs have been completed and the data has been written here and you will be able to see the tables out here. As I've already executed, it has overwritten that data into the sample file. And you also see the sample data here uh, because of the fact that I'm also writing to parquet format. Then again, this is the same one overwrite to the Delta parquet format. And these are the V order optimization command, which we are planning to use when we are going to do the exercise. I'll be back to the slides. So you can learn more about optimized Delta tables using this link, Delta Lake table optimization optimization and V-order. This will tell you more details about the what is the Delta table is, what is the Delta Lake, and how you do you are going to optimize the Delta format. So pretty detailed uh, article here. So you can scan the link or can go to aka.ms double A O eight B S N. That's what you can use. But that sounds really interesting. We are dealing with the Delta tables using Python. That's cool. Hey, Chris, what's next? We plan to insert now. All right. So we've just seen how to ingest data into the bronze layer of our lake house, right? So that term 
Blom's layer that refers to a paradigm called medallion architecture. Uh, and we're not going to go too deep into that today. We'll just explain that you know, our raw data is first stored that comes in, that goes into our bronze layer. That's like our staging layer. Uh, then what we'll do, we'll do some transforms on that. We'll turn that into the silver layer that becomes data that's appropriate to be used across the whole enterprise. Uh, and then lastly, we'll do some further uh, transforms you know, we'll probably structure the data into a star schema. We'll make it really easy to use for reporting and other analytics purposes. And that will be our gold layer. Now, that's not really the focus of this module, but yesterday uh, we've actually had two uh, different versions of the session. You can go to the Power BI channel, go to the live tab, and you will see two different sessions you can watch where they'll dive much deeper into the medallion architecture. Uh, I do see we have a couple of questions coming in. So before I get to the next slide, uh, Ahmed, do you want to take this one? We've got a question about, you know, is it possible to connect to on-premises services uh, with our, ex you know, connecting to our external data? Do you want to talk more about that? So as of now, to connect to the on-premises services, uh, we have to use uh, Dataflow Gen 2. Uh, the data pipelines and the notebooks are not directly connecting using the uh, data on-premise data gateway, uh, but we will wait. Some of these features may come in. As you know, in Azure, we have Azure data integration, which allows you to do that with Azure services. So in future, Mir might have similar one which is coming in and we will be able to use same things on the uh, Spark as well as data pipeline. But right now, the right choice is Dataflow Gen 2 in case you have on-premise data. Great. All right, let's hop back into the slide deck. All right, and next slide, please. Uh, so we were talking about transforms, right? That's going to take our data to the next layers. Uh, so here's some examples. Uh, you know, this is how we'll be turning our bronze data into silver data. So we want to look at how do we deal with null values or other missing values? How do we handle duplicates? Do we straight up remove them? Is there something else we need to do to them? Uh, so again, this session isn't really about you know, transforming, it's about ingestion. But there's another session, again, back to the live tab on the Power BI channel, and go back to almost the beginning of the series. I think it was the second one, and the title is called uh, Use Apache Spark Notebooks, I think, or just Use Apache Spark in Microsoft Fabric. Uh, so check that out, two different versions, and they'll go through all the transforms. All right. Uh, you know, I think now it's time to jump back into the demos. Uh, so we'll go through the exercise in this uh, Learn Live module. We'll go through it live with you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a Fabric notebook. We'll use PySpark to connect to a blob storage path. And then we'll load the data into our lake house using some of the right optimizations that Ahmed just went through. So some of this is going to be a review of what we've already talked about. That's great. Let's hit that as many times as, as much as possible, because uh, you really need to know this stuff if you're going to you know, proceed with taking the DP600 exam. Uh, so let me go ahead, if we could switch over to uh, my demos again. All right, so I'm going to just jump to the exercise page. So the first thing we're going to do, I've done a couple of these steps already because I don't want to make everyone watch while I create a Fabric workspace. Uh, so you want to follow these steps. You know, probably if you don't already have a Fabric capacity, you'll want to set up a trial. Uh, there's some links here to tell you how to do that. And then you're going to create a new lake house. That's really as simple as you're know, going to new, finding the lake house from the choices, give it a name and hit create. Now, again, as you see in the note here, that's going to take you know, a few minutes to spin up a new empty lake house. That's not really great you know, viewing entertainment. 
So we're going to go ahead and work with you know the uh, you know the lake house that I've already got created here. All right? See, it's it's completely empty. We've got no tables. We've got no files. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do, let's create a destination folder. Give me just a second. Let me make sure I've got everything in the right order. Uh, we're going to create a new subfolder under our files section. This is where we're going to end up putting the data that uh, we pull in. So let's create a new subfolder. We'll call it raw data. And I'm going to go to properties here. And I had already showed you one way how to grab that absolute path. Here's another way. Go do the properties of the folder. And we'll have this nice link here to copy that full path. I'm going to copy that to my clipboard. Drop it into a text editor here. All right, so that's the kind of the prep work that we need to do. So let's pop back over to here. We go. Next thing, you know, we're going to create a notebook just like we've already done. Uh, so let's go ahead, copy that code. Back here, let's go ahead and create a new notebook. Let's paste our code in. Again, not terribly helpful without uh, you know, a little explanation. So let's add to uh, some markup here. Connect to an external source. All right. Yeah, as you can see, the uh, the headings are usually a little bit bigger than I prefer, especially blown up so you all can read them. Uh, so let's go ahead and run this code. This is going to take, uh, I think, about 20 seconds, probably five or six to set up the session. And we'll run through, we'll read in our data. And we should see a message of what our path is. There's the message, should finish up. Any point now. Okay, so we've pulled our data into our data frame. Great, so let's hop on to the next part of, uh, just, yeah, let's just check. Here's our expected outcome. We wanna make sure we're, as we're working through the exercises, Every time we see this expected outcome, let's make sure we got that same thing. And yep, that's what printed. So we'll go ahead and we'll start writing the data to a file. So let's go ahead and copy the code to a new code cell. Again, let's show another way of doing it Add a code cell here. Let's paste in. And you see right here, we've got a placeholder for our file system path. So I'm hop back to my text editor. Let's go ahead and copy that. Back to Fabric. And in, in our notebook, let's insert that. Right. So we're going to save a file called Yellow Taxi. Here's our destination. We'll just output the path just as we you know, printed out the path here. Again, we'll print out our output path and we'll just load the first thousand rows. You know, we won't load the whole set. It's a pretty big data set. Let's just load the first thousand rows into our parquet file. So let's go ahead and we will run this. Hopefully this is a little quicker than the last time I ran this during practice. Uh, this was about, oh, about two minutes before. Uh, so this is probably a good time. I mean, do we have any more questions that have come in uh, since we uh, started the exercise? Yes. So one more question has come. Uh, that the question is, 
uh, SAP uh, data extraction using uh, the notebooks. So again, I think it would have two parts. If you have on-premise SAP or if you have the SAP which you can accept online. So uh, Chris, do you want to take this question? Uh, so I'm not really familiar with SAP, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so if, yeah. yeah, if you've got a good answer, yeah, by all means, go ahead. Yeah, sorry that I couldn't be much help there. Yeah. So in case of SAP, uh, so most of the thing has a Python connector means you have the SQL kind of a connectors which are there uh, with the Python for most of that. And SAP also had that Python connector. So you will be able to connect to SAP using those. Now, you have to remember that SAP has CDS views, calculation views, and there are different kind of promotion, uh, permissions and the port opening is required to enable those things. If you are done with those settings, you should be able to access it using Python. Now, you will be able to access it using the notebooks in the fabric if it is a version which you can access online which is basically your uh, HANA, which is available outside your on-premise or on the cloud or HANA cloud. Now, if you're on on-premise SAP HANA or SAP, then again, you need to take the help from on-premise gateway. And that's where either SAP HANA, we have a connector for SAP HANA in the Dataflow Gen 2 using which you can connect. So Dataflow Gen 2 has connector for SAP HANA as well as BW using those you can connect. And we do have bring in the data very recently uh, using those connectors from the SAP HANA. Now, another thing which you can use if you have really large scale of data and uh, uh, want to do, and this is what we have also done is Azure integration runtime has CDS with SAP. And if you use that, it uh, also do the uh, change data capture and able to bring in the data in the incremental map manner and it has a destination as lake house very recently has been added a destination lake house it means even if you're a azure customer and using azure runtime for sap then you will be able to save directly data into the lake house so these are the options we have with the sap data flow gen 2 you can use and uh, with the uh, connector of hana as well as vw awesome well i just learned a bunch i hope everyone watching did as well uh, thanks, Ahmed. Uh, yeah, luckily that filled in the time and looked like it took us a minute and 48 seconds for everything to finish here. Uh, here's our expected output, the uh, the path that we've written the data out to. And so let's jump back into our over to our lake house. Uh, and let's here refresh our files. Come on, let's refresh files. Chris, maybe you refresh the tables part. Yeah, I should. This should just have written the file, though. Let's see. Yeah, raw data, yellow taxi. Yes, it should have written that. So let's go back into our notebook, see if we can tell what happened. Now it says we've succeeded. It says that, you know, that's the path. That's, yeah, that's my lake house. That's my raw data folder. That's the path we should be there. Okay, well, uh, that's unfortunate. Amit, uh, do you want to, I know you're gonna take over from here. Uh, do you want to you know, try running that piece uh, on yours and show everyone what that's gonna look like? Or do you just want to jump straight into uh, the transforming piece? Yeah, actually I was executing along with you and seems like uh, it has worked for me. So, um... So if uh, hopefully the my screen is visible now. So uh, if you see this, is, yeah, let me check it out. Yeah, fine. Uh, so this really is the file name. Look, you're, you're really making me look bad today. You've got all the answers and my demos are blowing up. I love it. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, 
So we have this uh, Parquet output file, and then I'm printing the path, which you might have already seen here. And then we have the blob df limit, which I have put down. And uh, this means I'm going to limit my uh, the data flow by 1,000, and then I'm writing it down to the Parquet format. And if you see on the right hand side, you already see that uh, yellow taxi folder, which is there in the raw data. And then we have this um, data, which is written into the format. So now let me go to the Lake House Explorer and, and explain you a little bit here. So if I further click on this yellow taxi data, you will see the parquet format files. And then there is an underscore success, which is showing you that the file has been written to the Lake House. Now, this is when we are writing down to a parquet format. And let me show you the last example when I saved the file as a parquet format into the tables, what happens in that case. Again, you see that the, all the files, the parquet files have been saved here along with the success. And it is showing undefined. Now, there are two cases where it can show undefined. One is when I'm loading a file format into the tables, which is a little bit different, like parquet, which is not a delta parquet. It's not going to be considered as table. CSV or blob, any other format would be showing this. Sometimes when you load the data and you immediately come to the lake house, it takes a little bit of time to register the table and you may see this undefined. So the only way is that you just go ahead and refresh the tables again or press the refresh button here on the top and you should be able to see it as the table just like this sample data in case you are using the correct data pocket format. So most of the time when you write from data, flow gen 2 or data pipeline, you are going to write it into the Delta Parquet format only. When you use Python, you have these kind of options where you can write in any format. So preferably write all the other formats into the file and write Delta Parquet into the table. Now let's jump back to our exercise. Now I'm going to take you to the data transformation code. And uh, while it may take a little bit time, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first execute it and then I'll continue to explain you what is happening here. So see, uh, we have a lot of option in Microsoft Fabric for data transformation. Now we have data flow gen two, where you can bring in the data and do the transformation. Then if you are using the warehouse, you can do it using SQL also. For lake houses, if you want to do transformation, we don't have SQL because SQL is read only. So one option is data flow gen two while bringing in IDA it, or the other option is I use the Microsoft Fabric Notebooks, which is I'm using right now. So what I'm doing here, let me explain you. So I'm bringing in this library, uh, which is column, timestamp, current timestamp, year and month, the libraries I'm bringing in. Then I'm, diff I'm getting my raw DF, which is spark.read.parquet, output parquet path, which is already defined in the above cell. Then I'm trying to create a filtered df and the name filter df is just the name and the reason for it is because we are trying to filter with the column so we are saying filter with the column with this is the column which we want current time stamp and then we are so and then the next step which we are doing is filter df store and flag is not null so we are trying to get the data which is not null using this particular step the next step is we are defining a table name as we have seen in the past. And then we are using on the data frame, data frame name dot write dot format delta because we want it as a table mode as append. Now I'm using append mode. So if we might have executed the example previously, it might actually append the data, not override the data. So it will duplicate that. So you need to be careful while defining these things and save as table and table name. And then I'm trying to display the the rows here and i'm only displaying the one row which is the current time filter and which i have applied so which is not null so this is what i'm trying to display store uh, not null is the row which i'm getting it and i'm displaying it now check this out whether it has created something or not i will go to the tables on the left hand side and press this refresh and as you can see yellow taxi was the name which we have given and we got the file with the name yellow taxi. Now let's move to the next step, which is optimizing the Delta writes. Now we have learned a couple of commands previously, which can optimize the write. 
Now look at this time and because these are small data, it may not improve really um, much, but we have taken around 23 seconds to write the last file. Now, if I execute this command with the right optimization, um, what would happen to that? So again, I'm defining a new data frame. Then again, I'm doing the filter with column, df.filter, which is store and uh, flag not null. And then I'm doing these two configurations, spark.config.set, spark.sql.parquet.vorder.enable true. So I'm enabling the V order and there is an article which was shared on the slides before that. Please go ahead and read about that. And then similarly, we have the spark.microsoft.delta.optimizeWrite.in enable true. These two is going to make sure that we are going to write faster. And to differentiate between the two, and because later on we are going to experiment with these two tables also, the table name to be given is yellow taxi opt. And again, the format is going to be delta because we want it to be read as a table in Microsoft Fabric, dot append, dot save as table and table name. And then I'm trying to display one row so that I'm aware that this data get loaded properly. So let me try to execute and cross your fingers. So as you can see, this was pretty fast, 23 seconds last time. And this time we are just done in five seconds. So seems like write is really fast here. Chris, do you feel that? Oh, that's great. Okay, so now let's do some analysis. And what we are going to do is we are going to use SQL for that. Now, those of you who are aware of Spark Python, you know that you know we can also use SQL to run it. And sometime once we get the data as a temporary tables, uh, what we call as temp views, we can also directly run the SQL query. So first we were going to try the functions of the Python spark.sql or spark function spark.sql to check out how do we do that. And later on, I have tried a little bit of code, uh, which I'm trying to directly run the SQL and let's see if we are able to do that or not. So the table name is delta table name, a variable, and the yellow text is the table name of the first table which we had. And then we are saying spark.read format, spark.read.format delta, delta format you are reading, and the table name is this. Now, because I am already in the lake house folder and I should be able to read it, and Spark is already configured for me to work in this particular folder. Then table.df data frame which is already been created, create or replace view allows you to have the table in the memory and that's which we are going to use. And that's the name we are giving. So using this particular name, yellow taxi tam, we should be able to run the SQL queries. And those of you who like SQL a lot and want to use that, this is the one of the way you can do it in the Python. And then we are trying to display the 10 rows from there. We are selecting everything and we are displaying 10 rows. If you want, you can restrict that in the SQL level also. I'm running that and this is going to take a little bit more time. The one which is we are querying with yellow taxi. And it has displayed the data in seven seconds, including the display time. And as you can see, we are able to see the first 10 rows of the data using the SQL in the Python code. Now the same, now the same code we are going to try on the optimized table, the yellow taxi OOPT table, which we have created. And again, let me go to the tables, click on the three dots and click on refresh to see have we got the table. Yes, we have the table yellow taxi opt and this is what we want to query now. And the data frame name we are changing a little bit opt table.df spark.read format delta dot table which and the table name and again create and replace view and then sql and then the display okay so let me go ahead and run this code and you can see the difference pretty much visible from five seconds we are down to two seconds so how much role the right optimized play you it's pretty much visible one when we have saved the data and now when we have 
actually got the data back we can see the difference between the timing and let me highlight that for you now what i've done is i've also tried a attempt to run the sql now what i have actually done is i actually changed it from uh, python pyspark to the spark sql and run it but today let me take a little bit of risk here and see does it run with the percent percent sql and yes so once the temporary table is ready the temporary view what we call once you executed this statement create or replace temp view with the name you can go ahead and use that name to query by using percentage percentage sql just the date the whatever you want so here i have used the limit instead of querying the full data and then filtering out using the python code df data frame i just use the sql and in that one i have used limit 10 this is a little bit different from the sql server where you use top 10 star here we use limit function then again let me do the count on this table from on the optimized table again and these are the rows which i have inside the database or inside the table let's run one more we are doing here the analysis so definitely without aggregation what is the analysis so let's run the sum on the percentage sum on the passenger count and sum on the trip distance and let's run one more sql and as you can see quickly we got the data for both of these so it means you can in this single notebook can run the PySpark code and then get your data and then you continue to analyze it by using the SQL expressions and you can write down as complex SQL as you want. Uh, and so this is the manner and the other place where you could have run the SQL is definitely the SQL endpoint of the lake house. So once data is loaded, SQL endpoint is available and that's where also you can use SQL. So notebooks and SQL endpoint, both you can utilize. So I think now Chris will take you through the knowledge check. Excellent. I know this is everyone's favorite part of the, of the session. So let's see that first question. Okay, so what is the benefit of using fabric notebooks over manual uploads for data ingestion? Uh, and yeah, you don't forget, uh, follow the link uh, to uh, put in the poll. We know Ahmed has all the answers. We know he's going to get these right, but we want everybody else to try as well. Let's try along with him. Uh, let's see how we're doing. Uh, so here are three options. Right? A, so the notebooks provide an automated approach to ingestion and transformation. B, Notebooks can orchestrate the copy data activity and transformations. Or C, notebooks offer a user-friendly, low-code experience for large data sets. All right, let's see how the results are coming in. OK, it looks like we've got a few coming in. Amit, you've been uh, on top of everything uh, this morning. Uh, tell us the answer here. Uh, uh, tell us why you chose that answer as well. So the answer, uh, according to me, should be A, the notebook provides an automated approach to ingestion and transformation. So in Microsoft Fabric, uh, we can use notebooks. Uh, so, so the second option was orchestrate and copy data. That's typically the job of the pipelines. Uh, user friendly and low code experience that is data flow gen 2 uh, notebooks are you know really powerful tool where you can write down the python code or spark code or the r code and can your things done and one more important thing to note that yes you can call your notebooks inside the pipelines so you can orchestrate the complete end-to-end uh, -end flow using the uh, notebooks and the pipeline great well, it looks like nearly and of the people agreed with you and you got it right. Perfect. A is the answer. 
All right, let's try with question number two. Okay, so what is the purpose of B order and optimize right in our delta tables? So option A, uh, B order and optimize right, that sorts the delta table when queried with PySpark in a fabric notebook. Option B, uh, B order and optimize right, enhance delta tables by sorting the data and creating fewer, larger parquet files. Or C, V order and optimize right to create many small CSV files. All right, so let's take a few seconds and let's see some of those answers coming in. I All think right. this would be a little bit challenging because to me also the two options seems very near to each other. So in, in the end, which one would you go for? So we will go for the B. So definitely C is not an option because we are uh, talking about the CSV files and that's not the format which we deal with uh, in the Delta Lake or Microsoft Fabric. We always need Delta Parquet. Now the option was between the first one and the second one. And we are actually what we are trying to do here is basically uh, so write enhanced delta tables uh, by sorting, creating fewer and larger parquet files. So basically we are creating, going to create a little bit larger files instead of very small, small files. So what happens, you can read a larger file and that also gives write optimization as well as read optimization. So, uh, so basically it's an optimization of size as well as the ordering of the data. Right, and in fact, that delta tables are optimized for a lot of things, right? It's not just optimized for querying with PySpark. It's optimized for everybody that's reading that Parquet file. So that's one of the, you know, the tricky pieces here. That's, we see that caught out a few of you, and that's probably why. Uh, all right, let's move on to the third question. All right, so why should you consider basic data cleansing when you're loading data into your Fabric Lake House? Is it A, to reduce data load size and processing time? B, is it to ensure data quality and consistency? Or C, is it to enforce data privacy and security measures? I think this should be Okay, looks like uh, everybody, almost everybody's getting this right. Looks like we're finishing off with a fairly easy one. So this is this is what we call in the states a nice softball. Uh, so Amit, do you want to tell us what the the answer is here? So the answer is B to ensure the data quality and consistency. I think for any analytics project, it is really important to have data quality and consistency. So that is the purpose of the data cleansing exercise. And I think the other options are for different purpose, but not for the data cleansing. What's your opinion, Chris? Yep, great answers. Okay, good job, everyone. Uh, yeah, over 80% of people got that one right. All right, so let's keep going. All right, so here is, uh, let's talk about you know, what we've learned today. Uh, so we should see you know, kind of what we covered at the top of the session. Uh, we want to ingest our external data to our fabric lake houses uh, using Spark. We want to show the difference between configuring the external source authentication, and um, it showed how to optimize some of that. And then he showed how to load our data into our lake house, uh, either as files or you know as delta tables. Uh, so we've got some time uh, remaining. Uh, if there are any questions, yeah, you know, please get them in now. Uh, let's try and stump Martin or uh, see if he wants to pass some along to us. Uh, so. 
Amit, was there anything, while we're waiting for questions, was there anything that you particularly learned that you liked while uh, you were going through uh, this module? Yeah, I think uh, the write optimization is something which I liked a lot, the V order write optimization. Uh, that helped a lot, means uh, that improved performance, uh, as we have seen today, that is pretty helpful. Um, I have done a few experiments with this park uh, in the past also, but I think this was a very good learning. And then, you know, uh, those of you who want to run the on-premise one, uh, you have the Azure where you have to create the keys and then you will be able to access the uh, data and then you will be able to play around with the Python. Okay. How do we manage incremental loading? There is one question coming in. Okay, well, I think if, uh, you know, one, one thing we do with that is we create a set up our notebooks uh, and we'd use uh, some of the Delta merge commands uh, to do our, you know, our upserts into our tables. And then we'd schedule those. What we didn't show in the notebooks was just how easy it is to schedule these notebooks to run, uh, you know, on a daily, weekly, you know, whenever basis. Uh, it's really just a couple of clicks uh, to schedule. Uh, so that, yeah, that's how I'd start that. Amit, um, do you have anything you'd like to add to that particular answer? So basically, uh, so when you talk about incremental, there are three ways you can think about the incremental. Incremental is append only when the source is always giving you the new data or you are able to run a query which is going to ensure that you are only getting the new data. And this is typically the data where the create date is the final date which is going to decide, okay, uh, this is the data and is going to always going to be append. Now it's easy for you in the notebook because we have the mode as append available. So every time when you're reading the data, you can do that. Now, typically how we do it in case the source is not all giving the data, but it uh, we need to pass a date. So basically when you can run a SQL query on the source. So first what we're going to do is we are going to read the data, the max of the date from our table or a log table, and then pass that date while running the SQL statement at the source. And we'll only get the new data and then we append it. This is the first method, which is append only. Now the other two methods are basically delete and insert and then update and insert. Now delete and insert is the methodology you use when there is a data which you think getting updated in the past, but you don't have a method or primary key, you can update it. This typically happens with the fact tables where you might not have a primary key to update your data, but you know the data is going to be updated in the past. So the option you have is you have to delete the data and then you have to update it. Now, I have typically done that using the SQL where I've actually taken the date, which is my last call. So what I do is I'm going to collect the data from the source after let's say creation date. But I know some of those dates, data is going to come back and it's going to update in the past. So what I do is I move my creation date in the past. So let's say I'm going to collect data for last one month. Then I go ahead and delete the data into my current table. And typically that exercise is pretty easy because I've done a lot on warehouse because I can run the SQL, but here you should be able to do that using notebooks. Then we actually insert it again. And the last option is update and insert where actually you need a primary key. So once you get the new data, you have to run an update statement. And for that, you are going to need a primary key to update the data. Uh, then there is a next question. Uh, uh, what are the data connectors available for notebooks? I'm not sure I have a good answer for that at the moment. I have to, to look at the documents and see what all is, is turned on at this point. Uh, to me, I think anything which you should be able to query with Python, uh, those are the connectors which are available and, uh, and you should look at the Spark Python or the Microsoft supported connectors. So we should have connector for most of the databases uh, available with us. Then the CSV file on cloud files, then we have Azure connectors available for most of the Azure connectors. We have that authentication based uh, things which are available. So there's a wide variety of range available because of the Python as well as the uh, Microsoft support on top of Python and Spark. 
All right, so we've got another question about how do we sync the contents created in Actile capacity? Can we sync them to our Azure DevOps repo? Or what are the options do we have to save the contents? Uh, so I'm not sure whether the person is meaning like the code, like the notebooks, or whether they're meaning just the data that's created. Uh, so as far as the notebooks, I'm not sure about the integration with GitHub. I haven't played with that yet, but you can of course download your notebooks. There's a download uh, button on every notebook to bring that code down. And then you can you know, upload those you know, when you go to a regular capacity later. Ahmed, have you played with uh, Azure GitHub, uh, you know, GitOps yet in Fabric? No, I have not played around. So I have very similar opinion as you that for the code part, most of the time we do have GitHub integration. So that should work out. All right. Here's another one. Is there a simple way to manage slowly changing dimensions or can it only be done with code? Hmm. So I have done it with the code actually. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, in Azure, we do have a out of the box, slowly changing dimension code, uh, uh, especially I think with the data flows uh, and data pipelines uh, maybe. So I think uh, right now what we have done is basically uh, we have created a code and done that. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, maybe you are, we have to explore more into the articles. There could be a, a easier way to do this, but I have done using the SQL code uh, into the data warehouse. And uh, I was able to achieve the slowly changing dimension. Yeah, my uh, same thing. Most of that I've done has been on the, the warehousing side with the with the SQL. All right. Uh, so we have a question here that I haven't experienced. Somebody's asking about a, they've seen a very complex notebook with a lot of PySpark functions and the notebook gets frozen. Uh, they're asking for suggestions how to solve this problem, but I haven't seen that, so I'm not sure what to recommend. Yeah, I think I've also not seen the only recommendation I may be having that, you know, split it into the couple of um, cells and try it out. But yes, I've also not faced this challenge. Okay. okay, okay. I think. Uh, Matt is saying that it may be the uh, browser memory issue. Also, maybe uh, clear up cache and make sure that uh, enough uh, memory is there for the browser. That could be another one. OK, so let's. Um, so hopefully, you have uh, and, uh, learned uh, in today's session. And if you want to practice and want to go ahead and look at it, so where do you find it? So you can go to HTTPS aka.ms.learnlive-2024-0207b. Hyphen b That's the shortcut you will be able to reach. Those of you who have already registered using the aka learning link should have access to the module from the place you have learned it. And in case you want to uh, uh, scan a QR code, a QR code is given on the page. Okay, so more sessions coming in. So today evening, uh, uh, different experts are going to explain what we have explained to you today. And uh, you can watch that session and those who are based out of US may be more suitable for them to watch that session. But don't miss out tomorrow morning again, administer Microsoft Fabric. Uh, this is the wave one last session, which is going to come the ninth session uh, where we go to cover the administration in the Microsoft Fabric. And in case you want to have more information about that particular module, you can scan these QR code or use these links. Okay, so that's the same information. These are the sessions we have done till from 23rd till now today. And those of you missed out, you can go to the YouTube channel and watch it. The Power BI YouTube channel has it. And uh, there is a playlist also, which uh, contain all these 
sessions so you can utilize all those uh, sessions which has already been given both in the morning and the evening for india and so these sessions were on getting started with end to end analytics and lake house in microsoft fabric use of apache spark in microsoft fabric uh, chris was talking about that session work with delta lake tables in microsoft fabric use of data factory pipelines in microsoft fabric that has been covered ingestion of data with data flow gen 2 in microsoft fabric another interesting session get started with data warehouses in microsoft fabric organize a fabric lake house using the medellin architecture design that is another session and i think some of the thing chris has also discussed today and today we have covered ingest data with spark and microsoft fabric notebooks and we will see you tomorrow for the administrator microsoft fabric so in case you have missed out any of these sessions you can go back and watch them and also if you have registered for learn live you should be able to access all these sessions content and able to practice the exercise so how do you upgrade to the microsoft fabric for those of you who want to upgrade to the microsoft fabric we have already enabled the microsoft fabric for us so uh, you will not be able to see options on our windows but usually there is a sign for uh, trial for free here and once you click on trial for free you should be able to get access to the microsoft fabric free trial a free trial is for 60 days and now it is counting uh, we know for some time when the trial actually started in may it was not counting and some of us were using that for 7 8 months now another thing to remember if your tenant has exceeded the capacity you will not get the trial in some cases i have observed that the very first time it doesn't create a trial it gives some kind of error and gives you the ppu trial and in such cases when you know that your capacity has the microsoft fabric trial available and you have not exceeded the limit just go and uh, create a ppu workspace and in that ppu workspace try to create a lake house and while you creating lake house most of the time it will upgrade you to the microsoft fabric trial and from there your trial should start this has worked most of the time for me but there was one exception that it worked after 2 days not immediately usually it worked immediately for me whenever i face this kind of challenge but in one scenario it do work after a couple of days all right i think that is it for this morning i hope everybody watching uh, learned a bunch i know i sure did uh i'm how do you think everything went I think it went really well um I I am big fan of Python and Microsoft um, Fabric Spark and uh, I got this opportunity to you know learn some of these tricks and uh, I continue to I'll continue to explore uh, more on the Microsoft Fabric notebooks and I think uh, this is going to solve quite a few problems which are a little bit complex in nature and Spark can do because of its uh, parallel uh, processing uh, capabilities. So, oh, great summary and I think that wraps it up for us uh, this morning. All right, thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye. Goodbye.